Hello, welcome to this second video on procedural generation for Comp 6259, Advanced Game Design at the University of Southampton. My name is Dave Millard, I'm one of the lecturers on the course. In this video we're going to be having a look at procedural content generation for game spaces. Let's start off by thinking about a number of methods we could use for creating indoor maps. So we're going to be looking at three different uh, algorithms, recursive backtracking, which is good for mazes, binary space partitioning, which is good for rooms, and random walks, which is good for caves. Now, this is absolutely not a definitive list. There are hundreds of different algorithms out here, but um, you know these are three of the more popular ones and could be very useful in your own projects. So first of all, let's consider recursive backtracking, which you can use for a maze. So the algorithm from here is relatively simple. We have a grid, we choose a starting cell, and then we begin a recursive algorithm. And the algorithm goes that while there are unvisited neighbours, we connect this cell to a random unvisited neighbour, and then we apply that algorithm to that neighbour. So let's go through that process with the grid here on the right. So we're going to pick our starting cell in the top left there with the yellow. Um, we're going to start the algorithm. We still have unvisited neighbours. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to connect this cell to a random unvisited neighbour. There we go. We've moved to the right. And then we're going to apply this algorithm to that neighbour. So this algorithm says while there are unvisited neighbours, and there are, there are uh, two um, adjacent cells to this one, um, we can apply the algorithm uh, to one of those at random. So we'll do that. We're going to pick at random the one below, and we call the algorithm again. So in this way, we gradually crawl around the maze, picking random directions um, and calling our algorithm until we get to the point where that initial condition of there being unvisited neighbours um, is no longer true. So in this case, we we do ha we have no unvisited neighbours. We have to go back. So this version of the function ends, and we go back to the previous version. Um, that function ends, and we go back to the previous version. And each time, we are checking to see whether we have unvisited neighbours. And when we get to this cell, that becomes true again. So last time we are at this level, uh, we went north, um, but this time we're going to go south. So the algorithm carries on. Um, and once more, it gets called recursively, picking random directions, exploring the maze, um, occasionally backtracking, um, until finally we get to the point where all the cells in the maze are completed. Now, uh, with this relatively small example, uh, it doesn't look too impressive, but when you have a, a large number of cells, this can create some really sophisticated and interesting uh, mazes. So let's move on to our second method, which is binary space partitioning, and this is particularly good for rooms. So in binary space partitioning, we create a, a, a space that uh, we want to, to place our, our rooms within. And when I say rooms, this is normally good for things like dungeons, for example. And then what we're going to do is we're going to divide the space either horizontally or vertically. We're going to pick at random. And we're going to repeatedly do that, repeatedly divide then the left or the right side um, either a set number of times. So here we're going to do it three times. Um, or you can do it until the divisions get to a certain size. So let's go through this process. So we're going to divide this space into two. So I'm going to pick a random uh, horizontal or vertical line. Here we've gone for vertical and a random position. So here it's it's uh, just slightly offset from the center. And then we're going to repeat both the left and the right. So we're going to divide the right into two and we're going to divide the, uh, the left into two. So here the left hand side we've divided horizontally and the right hand side we divided vertically. And um, for the diagram, every time I'm dividing here, I'm using the, the, uh, the same colour to show the division. So the pink side's been divided in half, the uh, green side has been divided in half. And then I'm going to call the algorithm again, and those pink spaces and the green spaces all get divided in half again, giving me two red spaces, two blue spaces, two orange spaces, and two purple spaces. Once we get to this point, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to fill in a random room within each one of those spaces. Now, the room could take up the entire space, or you could create a, a, a room that um, sits within the space. And that's what I've done here. So I've got rooms which are always smaller than the spaces they're in, but don't necessarily take up the full space. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect uh, rooms together um, at the point where they were divided. So what I mean by that is every time I divided a space into half, the rooms that are in that half are going to get connected. So I'm going to connect the two rooms in the red spaces together, the two rooms in the blue spaces together, the two rooms in the orange and the purple spaces together. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next level. So I'm going to go up a level. So now I've got the, the pink and the green side. 
the pink side was divided and the green side was divided and I'm going to connect the the rooms in the two halves of the pink side together and then the rooms in the two halves of the green side together there we go now depending on the algorithm I had for allocating the rooms um, I may or may not be able to draw a straight line to connect these two things together so sometimes you have to draw a little uh, uh, sort of a, a zigzagging line to, to get it in here but in this example they're all straight I then go back to the to the next level so that was my two dark gray areas and I'm going to connect those two areas together um, and there's my final dungeon so this enables me to create a connected space with different size rooms uh, where um, it's possible to navigate from one room to every other room in that uh, in that location so finally we're going to have a look at random walks this is very good for creating things that are irregular shaped things like caves so with the irregular walk, what we do is we start off with a, a random starting cell in a grid. And then while more than half of the cells remain, it doesn't have to be half, it could be any proportion, but we've gone for roughly half here. We're going to carve out the current cell, choose a random neighbor that isn't an edge cell, and then move to that cell. And when I apply this algorithm and go around this loop, that little orange square is going to start walking around the maze. And as it does so, uh, sometimes it will uh, go back on itself and revisit a space that it's previously cleared out, in other words it's already white, um, and sometimes it will carve out new space, and obviously the longer the algorithm goes on, the more new space gets carved out, until eventually I've carved out 50% of the cells and the algorithm stops, and I want, what I'm left with is a really nice irregular structure which has um, narrow spaces, large open spaces, it has interesting features, um, and gives me a, a kind of a, a nicer regular basis for, for maps where I need that to be the case. And of course I could combine this with some of the previous methods. So for example, in my binary space partitioning, rather than allocating a rectangular room in each of my partitions, what I could have done is used a random walk to create an irregular cave structure that was then connected um, to, uh, into, a, into a kind of a, a dungeon space, a series of rooms. Okay, so those are three methods for looking at indoor maps. Now let's go on and have a look at outdoor maps. And again, there are loads of different um, algorithms that you might use, but we're going to look at two here today. The first one is the diamond square algorithm, and the second one is the raindrop algorithm, which is a way of improving um, terrain maps. So terrain maps are slightly different in that we're not carving out spaces. What we're trying to do is to produce a surface that represent hills and valleys and uh, ridges and those kinds of things. So diamond square uh, is one of the most popular techniques. Um, you start off by setting the corner values of a grid uh, to be random within a particular range. Um, so here for example um, this range is 1 to 8 and I've picked a random number and I've placed it in each corner. And these, these numbers represent the height of that position of the map. And then I go into the algorithm. And first of all, what I do is I find every square of values. And in the first instance, I only have one, which is made up of my, my corner values I've just put in. And what I'm going to do is average them and apply them to the center value. Um, so I, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to um, average out the result and I'm going to apply a modifier. So in this case, I'm going to apply a modifier of minus 2 uh, to plus 2. So in this case, I'm going to add 8 and 5 and 2 and 6, divide by 4, add the random modifier, and that will give me another number. And in this case, it's given me the number five. And then what I do is I find every diamond um, the, of, of values, and I do the same thing, but with diamonds. Now, one of the problems with explaining this algorithm is the first time you do this, there are no diamonds in the grid, right? Because the diamond shapes overlap and go out the outsides. Um, it also means that when I average them, I have a, have, have a different strategy I might want to use. So for example, um, I might uh, create a random value for the off-site position, or I might just take the random value of the three that are available. So I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to use the three values that I can see to give me the uh, to, for the calculation. So in this case, if I take the left-hand one, um, I'm going to take 8 plus 5 plus 6. I'm going to add those together, divide by 3, and that's going to give me, uh, add my modifier, and that's going to give me the value. And I do that for all of the four diamonds that I've got in my particular shape. And at the end of that process, I, I started with four values, and now I have nine values. So I'm going to adjust my modifier by half, so my minus 2 to plus 1 becomes minus 1 to plus 1. And I'm going to repeat the algorithm again until all the values are filled. So let's go through that process. So remember, step one, I identify all the squares of values that I have. 
So now I've added in those middle values, I've actually got four squares. And for each of them, I'm going to um, average the four corner values, apply the modifier, and then add them to the center. Right. So uh, at the end of that process, half of my values are now filled in. And I'm going to take every diamond of values. And this time you can see whole diamonds because I've managed to populate some of the cells already. So I've got four diamonds in the middle, which all have four corners. And I have um, eight diamonds around the edge, each of which has got three corners. I'm going to do the same again. I'm going to take each of those diamonds. I'm going to average the values around them and then divide by either three for the ones on the outside or by four on the ones on the inside. Um, and that will give me a series of values in the middle. And at the end of that process, I've got my terrain map. So remember, this actually gives me a series of heights. So I'm going to convert that into a, a kind of um, a height map. Um, and then I can translate that into a 3D environment. And there you can see my valleys and my ridges and so on, just as I described. So what does a raindrop algorithm do? Well, that uh, topography that I just created, that terrain, um, the way that it works is it works by approximating what we see in nature. Another way of doing things is to actually copy the processes that occur in nature that give rise to the structures we see. And that's exactly what happens with the raindrop algorithm. So this simulates hydraulic erosion. So what happens is a raindrop falls onto a terrain map and then we, the droplet moves from the high to the low ground, eventually finding a, a pool somewhere to, to stop. And what it does is it removes sediment from the high ground as it goes and it deposits, deposits it at the low ground. I'm then going to iterate this thousands and thousands of times across the whole map. Um, and eventually what I will start to see is erosion occurring on the, on the surface. So for example, this is the map after 20,000 iterations. This is the map after 40,000 iterations. And this is the map after 70,000 iterations. And at this point, you can plainly see that we've got structures that look much more like what you'd see in, in nature. Um, and in this case, um, uh, we've also, or Sebastian Lag, the person who generated these diagrams, has also col coloured in the ground so that lower level ground or flatter ground is, is uh, green. And that also helps you see the, the impact. So here's what we started with. And here's what we end up with. So emulating nature is a very, very effective way of simulating and generating terrain. So we're now going to go on and have a look at how you might create other types of structures. So the algorithm we're going to use is the L system or Linden Mayer system. Um, so Linden Mayer was a Hungarian biologist and he came up with this system as a way of describing the way that plants grow and divide. It's an alphabet of symbols with rules for replacing one symbol with a new set of symbols. And then we iterate over time, repeatedly replacing rules again and again and again in order to create a kind of organic structure. So let me give you an example. So here's our L system. We're going to say we're going to start with zero. And the rule is every time we see a zero, when we iterate, we're going to replace that zero with one and then plus zero in brackets and minus zero in brackets. So what does this look like? At the start, I have a zero. My first iteration, that zero gets replaced with one plus zero minus zero. And then in the second iteration, each of the zeros in iteration one get replaced again with the same one plus zero minus zero structure from before. Until by iteration three, I've got a much more complex structure. And then how do I go about turning that into something that looks like a plant? Well, what I'm gonna do is convert that uh, list of symbols into a drawing by treating them as instructions to a drawing turtle. So in this case, zero is gonna draw a stem and a leaf. One will draw a stem, plus will turn left 45 degrees, and minus will turn right 45 degrees. And every time I iterate, I'm gonna scale down by 0 0.5. Okay, let's see how this works. So at the beginning, I only have a zero. And remember, when I have a zero, I draw a stem and a leaf. So there we go, there's the stem and the leaf. And then I do the second iteration. And on the second iteration, I scale down by 0.5. Um, and off we go again. So I do one, uh, which is drawing a stem. Um, and then uh, I'm going to do plus zero, which means I'm going to turn left 45 degrees and draw a leaf and a stem. And I'm going to do minus zero, which means I'm going to turn right 45 degrees and draw a leaf and a stem. It's worth just noting here that we're going to treat the brackets as kind of these special symbols to push and pop a position of our turtle. So in other words, having done the first plus zero, 
it will then go back to the top of the first stem before doing the second minus zero. So strictly speaking, this is a Lindenmayer system with brackets, but it's a very common approach for doing these kinds of structures. Um, on iteration two, things get even more interesting because now I end up with a stem leading to two further stems, leading to four uh, stems and leaves. And then in the third iteration, I get something which is beginning to look a bit more like a tree structure or a plant structure, where I've clearly got a, 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 a trunk with branches and sub-branches and so on. So the problem we have is this still looks a little bit too regular to be organic. So one way of solving the problem is we could keep the same structure, uh, so a regular structure, but we're going to add some variation to our drawing. So we get a sort of stochastic turtle that draws things slightly differently every time. So for example, instead of drawing stems and leaves the same, what we might do is every time we draw one, we're going to randomly draw one between 0.6 and 1.2 of the current iteration size. And if I apply that to the drawing on the right, I might end up with something a little bit like this. So this is starting to look a little bit more natural. Um, alternatively, going back to the original, uh, another way I could do this is I could keep the turtle drawing in a regular way, but I could create a stochastic structure. So what I mean by that is the structure is no longer regular. And I do that by attaching probability to the rules. So my original rule, which is 0 goes to 1 plus 0 minus 0, I'm going to say that only happens 50% of the time. That's denoted by the square brackets and the 0.5. And the other 50% of time, it goes to a plus 0 zero and minus zero. In other words, half the time branches will split into two and half the time they're going to split into three. So if I apply that to the drawing on the right, I might end up with something that looks a bit like this. And again, this looks a little bit more organic. organic. And then of course what I can do is I can combine both methods together so I end up with a, a completely stochastic structure and a stochastic turtle and I end up with a much more organic structure which looks like the thing on the right. So here's the regular L system on the left and the stochastic L system on the right and you can see which one looks more natural. Now I can apply this idea for um, L systems to other things as well. So let's have a look at buildings in profile. So I might say my starting symbol is a floor and my rule is that when I have a floor one of the things that can happen is I go to an archway with a floor on top of it. Um, when I have a floor I might alternatively go to a base with different structures on the left and right. So in this case an archway and a floor on the left and a tower and a tower level on the right. I might say another thing that can happen to a floor is it could go to a block and a floor or, and if I have a level it can go to a tower and a level. I might say that Levels could be more sophisticated and that at some point they end up with uh, a base with a steeple on the left and a tower on the, the right with another level. Or I might say a floor could end with a roof and a level could end with a steeple. And if I applied these rules and drew them in the way that I've just indicated, I would end up with a structure that looks like something on the right hand side. And if I ran this algorithm again with a different set of probabilities, I might end up with a, a different shape building. And you can imagine this not just working for buildings in profile, but also the, the layout of buildings as well. So I hope that's taught you a little bit more about uh, some of the different methods we can use for, for doing uh, generation at this level. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.